Good afternoon. Uh, I'm here today to present uh, Tipless and our uh, product, the International City. So the first thing uh, I'd like to say is just a little bit about Tipless. There's sometimes a misconception uh, about what we are. We're a Singapore uh, stock corporation. Uh, we're a group of both academics but also practitioners, uh, and we're actually in the business of trying to build free cities ourselves. Today, uh, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about the trends that we're seeing in special economic zones and special autonomous zones, uh, how Tipolis plans to capitalize on these trends, and then I'd like to highlight a couple of case studies to show that the business model is both proven uh, and achievable. I'm not the first person to say today, imagine if you had invested in Singapore uh, in 1965 or in Dubai 1985. It's a little bit of a weird thing to think about, uh, but I think no matter which way you want to come about this, uh, you think you'd, be, you'd have done pretty well. Part of the reason for this uh, is because we've seen uh, a rise in special economic zones over the last 50 years. Uh, as you can see down on the bottom left, uh, there was something like 30 special economic zones, uh, sorry, uh, 70 special economic zones in about 30 different jurisdictions uh, in 1975. In the most recent data, we're seeing just about 6,000 uh, across about 150 jurisdictions. So we're seeing uh, just about every single country that is not Western Europe uh, or the United States and Canada uh, that has some form of special economic zone. The challenge with this, uh, and sorry, these special economic zones, as you saw earlier with Andreas, uh, are actually becoming more autonomous over time. Uh, they're starting, we saw the, the financial centers that were established largely in the early 2000s. Uh, they realized lots of people are coming uh, to the financial center to do their business, and then they're spending money outside of it, in the restaurants, uh, in the, the nightclubs, and these sorts of things. Why don't we bring some of that in to the zone uh, and create a bit of more of an integrated zone? Well, what is an integrated zone? It's nothing other than a city. The challenge with special economic zones is that they're no longer enough. There's 6,000 of them. Making the 6,000 and first doesn't move the needle. We need institutional in in uh, innovation, and autonomy is truly the only way to get that, that institutional innovation. So what's the solution? The solution is international cities. It's not a concept that should be a surprise to you all. Imagine uh, the private company offering the services of a state. Uh, this is exactly Titus Gebel's model, and that's what we're building uh, at Tipolis. I'm not going to go through all of these legal requirements, but typically when we are going out and speaking with governments, these are the list of requirements that we ask for. We do want to be able to build our own commercial and business regimes. We do want to have our own property regimes. We want the government to stay out and let us be the sole uh, arbiter of governance decisions within the jurisdiction. And then some over on the right are a bit easier in some places and also a bit more difficult. We don't necessarily always get all 10 of these, but we think this is really a good starting point uh, for showing the world exactly how far reaching we think that special economic zones or special administrative regions need to go. So why are these international cities a good thing? Well, for the residents, they create open and thriving communities. There's fixed fees that can't be changed. They're typically in beautiful locations, at least if we can manage. They're free from internal political tension. No one has to fight over whether or not we're going to tax some group more in order to spend it on some so-called public good. We create a world-class business environment, and we're really leaving uh, personal sovereignty up to the individual. They can maximize their life as they see fit. And I say, that sounds great. How are we going to get governments on board? There are a number of ways that we can partner with governments. First, governments are very interested, as you've heard, in foreign direct investment and jobs. Those are the two key ones. Every single country is interested in them. On top of that, we're bringing in purchasing power into the country. We're bringing uh, index rating improvements, and, and these aren't just superficial numbers on a page, but index rating improvements help your uh, ability to uh, be able to access debt capital from the bond markets and these sorts of things. So it really does benefit the country uh, to be able to access capital so that they can build additional infrastructure even outside uh, of an international city. We're attracting qualified migration. That means stopping the outflow of very high potential, high productive 
uh, residents within a host nation. It also means bringing back people that have left that country for better opportunity. And it also means bringing in expats. So there's three different mechanisms by which we're really trying to bring in more attractive potential. And finally, there is a level of profit sharing with the government in many cases. Just a little bit technically, interna international cities are special administrative regions of a host nation. Uh, they're still under the sovereignty of the host nation. In fact, I would argue that it's actually an act of sovereignty by the host nation to create something such as this. Uh, con the Constitution and international st treaties still apply, but basically everything else in our ideal scenario is within the scope uh, of Tipolis. So what's the business model? Well, Tipolis is what we call an active holding company. It will be the parent company that's looking to establish a portfolio of international cities all across the world. As you can see here, some of our examples, we're talking about both uh, you know, island type of places, mainland type of places, uh, Latin America, Asia, et cetera. Uh, we're, we're looking to establish a number of these. Ultimately, throughout the portfolio, each one of them will pay back a network fee of some sort uh, to Tipolis. Uh, for, for being sort of the overseeing parent and making sure that there's centers of excellence in each one of these cities. So how do the cities themselves make money? Mostly through two mechanisms, the first of which is through fees. They'll charge fees in accordance with the resident contract that they sign with every single resident that moves into the city voluntarily. The same thing goes with companies that are established, uh, and then of course administrative services are largely charged at cost. Uh, there, there can be a, a couple other forms of fees, but those are really the main two. We think it's possible to make money on providing governance as a service, but frankly, it's not uh, the biggest uh, opportunity that there is. The real upside that we see is through land appreciation. We think that there's a number of mechanisms that lead to the land appreciating uh, in an international city that makes this a very attractive entrepreneurial endeavor. First, when you buy a very large plot of land and then you start to subdivide it, you know, there's economies of scale. So we think that the value per unit uh, is actually going to increase by buying a bulk and then selling parcels to individual residents. We're going to unshackle all the restrictions on builders, uh, all, all the uneconomic shackles that, that currently uh, kill the ability to develop uh, you know, in London, as we heard, and in many places in the United States as well as elsewhere. We're going to develop a lot of the land. We're taking, in most cases, rural land and developing a city. So we're going to get that appreciation that you typically see from rural to urban uh, land. And then finally, we're going to put the world's best jurisdiction on top of it. If you do the math here, we think that this is about a 450,000 times appreciation in land potential. It's not necessarily a shock then to see if you take land in call it rural Latin America or rural Africa. And then you compare it to the land prices in Monaco, Singapore, Dubai, Hong Kong. You actually are getting these sorts of appreciation. You're getting hundreds of thousands of times of appreciation. And that is the reward that we're perceiving at Tipolis. I'd say that sounds great, but how do you protect these from the various risks that are going to uh, come about. These governments uh, are going to want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. Well, there's a number of different mechanisms. The first is the legal and the political. We've heard a little bit about that through setting up bilateral investment protection treaties. Uh, we also know that you can set up joint commissions with the government. There's also economic ways uh, to get people on your side. You, know, you create jobs. You make it very politically difficult uh, to remove this sort of jurisdiction. We saw this with a lot of special economic zones, in particular in Honduras uh, decades ago. Uh, they, they created enough jobs with their special economic zones that even though the left-leaning party came into power, they couldn't get rid of it because it was employing so many people. You can also give shares in the project company to either the government and or the individuals in that country or in that region. Then on the strategic side, you can have a diversity of types of projects, a diversity of sorts of governments that you're working with. You can attract highly mobile people uh, to move, uh, all of these sorts of things. One of the most important ways we think that you can protect your investment is actually through having the portfolio approach, through not being subject to just one government. 
and we're doing just that. This is why we're trying to create a number of opportunities all over the globe. As you can see here, these dots all represent various governments that we've talked with. Uh, before you start trying to fine-tune exactly which one, they're all moved slightly, so uh, you won't be able to tell exactly who we're in, in discussions with. But we're trying to give an indication through this map to show just how many discussions we're having. You know, some of them are more advanced and some of them less advanced. And really, at any given time, we are really in communication with about 10 different governments trying to prioritize where uh, we would like to move forward. So the question is, this all sounds great, but you said that this business plan was achievable. And I think that it is. I think that there's a number of things that we can learn from both in the past and the present, the present that ultimately uh, tell us that this is not easy, but it is possible. First, many of you have heard of the Hanseatic League, the Free Imperial Cities, the Venetian Republic. All of these retain some elements, if not many elements, of what it means to be a special administrative region or an autonomous city or a free private city, whatever name you'd like to give to it. On top of just historical examples, there's also modern day examples. Hong Kong comes to mind, a great special administrative region. Of course, it's going through challenges right now. It is subject to a little bit of political power from Beijing. That's absolutely true. But why is Hong Kong the great success story that we can point to? It's because it's a special administrative region. Prospera that we just heard from in Morazan would also count in this domain. The last one I'd like to point to is the Dubai International Financial Center. And Andreas Baumgartner, who was here earlier, was in, quite involved in this project. We think that this, in many ways, counts as a special administrative region as well. Like I said, it really is a special economic zone focused on the finance and business industry. But what they've done is they've incorporated many of those other services that it means to live in a city into the zone because that's how they could maximize the most value add within the zone and make the biggest profit. Just to show you how much financial success they've had, these are some public numbers uh, about the zone. So I think first on, on the left, you can see the ways in which it exhibits a lot of uh, the facets of what it means to be a, an international city or a special administrative region. It has a lot of internal autonomy. There's common law, common law judges. Uh, and it's run by a sort of executive type team as opposed to a democratic or democratically elected team. You know, the revenue there is pretty substantial, 288 million, and the operating margin well over 50%. That's pretty substantial for a zone that is, and these are basically all on the fees uh, that they have for various businesses. You can also see the total assets and, and the uh, uh, innovations that have come uh, from all of the various companies. Finally, I think that there's a lot to learn from existing microstates, uh, existing city-states, these sorts of things. Singapore obviously comes to mind, uh, so does Monaco. Titus lives in Monaco, and I think there's a lot we can learn from them. One of the profit opportunities I mentioned earlier was both that we could make some money through uh, resident fees, and the other way we could make money is through uh, land appreciation. To show you what, we, you know, what we're perceiving here, we did a simple exercise with Singapore. If you take the average price of land in Singapore and you multiply it by the square area, we think the value of the land in Singapore is close to worth $5 trillion. If you then take the GDP of Singapore and you say the governance service provider, in this case the government, but if we were in charge of the service provider, you can get a 10% margin. Then we're talking, and then you capitalize, so every year they get 10% of the GDP, and then you capitalize that, then you get a value of about 470 billion. So if you add these together, we're getting a, a land val or we're getting a total value of Singapore, at least one metric, that it's worth almost five and a half trillion dollars. And that's exactly the business opportunity that Tipolis is perceiving with every single one of its different cities. We're going to increase the land value and we're going to make some profit on the resident fees. This is a huge task, but the trend is our friend. And even better for us, that history validates the model. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. And if